Okay, this is one of my favourite all-time games of Kasparov. It features a very controversial gambit early in the opening, uh, which later was coined the Kasparov Gambit. Karpov playing white plays e4. Um, so Kasparov plays his favourite Sicilian defence. So we have knight f3, e6. There's fairly standard moves here. Um, the game was also featured, by the way, in Bats for Chess openings, and I was always very fond to replay it, because it was right in the preface. Um, Raymond Keane was describing um, the knight in this game as an octopus, as we'll see later. So first we, we arrive at this position where Karpov has tried to create this Maroxy bind on Kasparov to try and prevent d5. Now, amazingly, Kasparov still plays d5 here as, as a gambit. Um, he's done quite a lot of preparation for this gambit before the game. But subsequently after the game, um, it wasn't played too much because an antidote was found. But in this game, this was a surprise novelty right out of the opening. Uh, grandmasters, apparently in the analysis room, was, were slamming down their fists, saying this cannot be, you know, sound. Karpov, he, he took and he, he won his pawn on d5, so he's a pawn up here. Knight b4. So what has Kasparov got here? Well, this knight is destined for the d3 square, as we'll see. After bishop c5, castles, castles, bishop f3, white's taken off uh, the bishop from this diagonal, and now uh, Kasparov plays bishop f5. So he's a whole pawn down here, but he's got this idea that this knight's going to be fantastically active on d3, an octopus, as Raymond King had, to, had described. Bishop g5. Rook e8. So as as well as this, Kasparov may be blockading this pawn here, and um, these knights are not too good here, especially this knight on a3. So there's a little bit of dynamic uh, compensation here for the pawn. Um, so knight d3. So we start to see a lot of pressure now from black. So this knight is just so many squares that it covers, and. Um, but is this enough? Will Kasparov be able to get this pawn back here, this, this d pawn? We'll see now. First of all, um, knight ab1. We see these knights kind of tumbling as well around each other. h6, bishop h4, b4. So Kasparov, he seems to be gaining a little bit of space on both sides of the board now. And again, these knights, you know, it's like they, they've become drunk or something. We've got a knight here and a knight here. Drunken knights, and, and um, Kasparov, he plays bishop d6. So, You'll see that you know his bishops are also very good, and generally you know his position is very active. So White's kind of dislocated in a very unusual way here. That is dislocated from from this d pawn at the moment. It only takes a little bit more pressure, and this d pawn is going to drop. Bishop g3, rook c8, b3 now. Um, so potentially he's going to. Karpov is rerouting this knight from b2 to c4 sale to challenge this d3 knight. g5 now, so gaining space on, on the king side. It's quite incredible, really, um, the kind of audacity of this, this strategy, this dislocation of white to protect the d-pawn, and this space gaining on both sides. You know, it's quite amazing, really. And these knights that, you know, on, on the sides of the board, virtually, so we see now the d-pawn is really, um, can be taken almost now. Uh, but Kasparov first tortures Karpov positionally. He doesn't just casually just take the d-pawn. He plays knight d7. And after bishop g2, he plays queen f6. So the queen's fine on this diagonal, and it's also stopping this knight b2. Um, so this knight stranded on the edge. Um, it's quite a dramatic picture really here, building up. After a3, um, Kasparov reinforces this bind with this b-pawn, so he's got lots of space. And notice how also this knight is stopping rook c1, so it's almost as if Karpov's in a kind of zugzwang already, with these, you know, his pieces just getting more and more passive here. And he can't challenge any of these two files. So it's an incredible picture, this position here, if we just look at it briefly. I mean... Amazing, really. Karpov, he plays queen a2 now. It's not the most active queen move in the world. The queen's, you know, blocked on this diagonal. and He's just moving the queen to the side. His, his idea is probably just to double rooks to try and get rid of this menace, this knight on d3. After bishop g6, 
Um, D6 was played now. So what was the point of D6? Could Kasparov, for example, just play Queen takes D6 here? Um, let's have a quick look. Queen takes D6. Maybe, you know, Knight D2. And, and, and White's getting out a little bit. But anyway, Kasparov, he, he doesn't do that. He continues this sort of getting white in zugzang strategy by playing g4. Because it's further adding a little bit of a bind. If, if white plays f3, there's going to be um, g takes f. After queen d2, king g7. Now, Karpov's had enough here of this strangulation, this slow strangulation on the king side as well. He unleashes, tries to unleash his position with f3. Now Kasparov takes on d6. Um, so he doesn't mind this g-pawn uh, being lost, so he's still going to be a pawn down. But queen d4, and now if he wants material back he can have it. But he doesn't just want material back. Now this is another fantastically you know, artistic combination here. He plays knight f6. So the, both of these knights are going to be amazingly central, centralised. After knight e4, I mean it's quite awesome really, isn't it? The black position here with these knights. Queen takes d3. Now this um, leads to a, a wonderful combination. Knight f2 check, rook takes f2. So black wins white's queen now. So Karpov may have thought he's, he's going to get enough material for the queen. But his pieces are sort of tumbling on the first rank now. After a queen e3, rook takes d3. Kasparov plays a brilliant move here. Uh, just exploiting the, the back row weaknesses. He plays rook c1. And look at these helpless knights still, and this, this bishop's uh, not very useful as well for the back row. Um, after knight b2, Kasparov plays simply queen f2, now threatening rook e1 check. So it's a kind of back row disaster. And I think Karpov was in time trouble as well here, which didn't help. So after knight d2, rook takes d1, knight takes d1, rook e1, and it's all over. It's mating two. I just was amazingly, you know, impressed by the artistry of this game, and um, it was prefaced in bats for chess openings, as I said, um, which meant, you know, when I looked at my openings book, I'd always like preview this game again, have a quick look at it. Um, it's just wonderful how, you know, this knight on d3 could have such a paralyzing effect on White's position, and how these knights, you know, they joined to this central control. So powerful centralization. So the final theme was this back row weakness. I just think this is one of the most artistic games of all time, to be quite honest. One of, one of my favorite games that Kasparov has ever played.